Hey, so we often think of industrialization, consumerism, and global trade as very modern phenomena. The terms conjure up images of conveyor belts, assembly lines, factories churning out smoke and bustling cities. But what if I told you that many of these aspects could already be seen in China and across the Indian Ocean by the 9th and 10th century CE? I am Anirudh Kanisetti, historian and author of Lords of the Deccan. Welcome to Thinking Medieval, where every week we tell you something new about our complex, innovative past. Always feel free to check out our research and citations below and join us in figuring out how to think about our messy, bloody, dazzling history. In the 830s CE, a ship tried to make a daring crossing. Navigating treacherous reefs and shoals, it was attempting to move from the South China Sea to the Sunda Strait between Java and Sumatra. After a brief stop there, it planned to catch the monsoon winds to India. But this attempt failed, and the ship's contents, ranging from marvelously carved golden plates to glazed ceramics, from a diplomat's inkstone to a small toy dog meant as a gift for a child, sank to the bottom of the sea near present-day Belitung, Indonesia. Today, this cargo and other evidence reveal the incredible interactions between medieval China, India and West Asia, including multicultural embassies, splendid gifts, and even bureaucratic panic due to India's overwhelming trade advantage. The most striking remains found in the Belitung shipwreck are a collection of over 60,000 ceramic dishes. These dishes were produced in the tens of thousands using standardized templates by something resembling an assembly line with teams of workers dedicated to shaping the clay, painting, glazing, firing, and then packing it. After being finished in Changsha in south-central China, they were packed and shipped to the embarkation port of Guangzhou. This consignment consisted of bulk orders placed by West Asian merchants as revealed by the decorative motifs used on the ceramics, which were similar to examples from Iraq and the Persian Gulf. There were large communities of these merchants in Guangzhou. So let's think about how they arranged such an enormous shipment. These immigrant merchants in Guangzhou must have had some reliable source of information about ceramic trends in their homelands. Perhaps they visited themselves or had relatives and colleagues with whom they corresponded or exchanged goods. Next, there were means of arranging capital for so many ceramics. There must have been some guarantees or surety provided by potential buyers in West Asia, which was then transmitted to the merchants in China. Finally, the ship chartered to carry the goods was of Indian or Arab design and was crewed by sailors from both these regions. This crew must have had considerable knowledge of shipping routes and markets since they were in Guangzhou in the first place. All of this is really impressive in a world where international movement depended on the seasons and the ingenuity of sailing technology. So with all the hopes riding on the ship, we can imagine the horror and consternation when it was wrecked. We can certainly relate to all the money lost, but maybe we can also relate to the terrible grief that must have been felt, for instance, by the children of the crew. The toy dog I mentioned earlier, which was bought perhaps by a now lost father, would never reach its little owner. Thousands of pottery sherds discovered in archaeological digs revealed that the Balitung shipwreck was one among many ships that moved between medieval West, South and East Asia. Across the South Indian coast, but especially in Tamil Nadu, historian Professor Noboru Karashima found evidence of Chinese pottery dating to as early as the 9th century. These ceramics were highly sought after as luxury goods, owing to their designs and quality, and also because they could store food at high temperatures without losing their rich colors or cracking. Excavations at the Chola Palace at Gangai Chorapuram found large quantities of these ceramics, dating to the 11th century and possibly brought back by embassies sent by the Chola court in 1015, 1033, and 1079. More on them in these two videos. So, while we've discussed these embassies in early editions of Thinking Medieval, the converse is really talked about. Chinese emperors sent multiple embassies to South India from the 13th century onwards. At the same time, the archaeological record shows a sudden increase in ceramic sherds found along the coast. Just as South Indian kings and merchants recognized the value of commerce, Professor Tan Sein Sein shows that so did the Chinese, especially the rulers of the Yuan dynasty, who were of Mongol descent. Seeking both a military and commercial expansion, the Yuan ruler Kublai Khan sent no less than 14 missions to India in his reign. 
The objective of these missions was to secure embassies from the Pandya Kingdom as well as from smaller trading cities such as Korikord and Kollam on the Malabar coast. Interestingly, we know that Kollam's local Christian, Jewish and Muslim merchants also sent embassies to the Yuan court, joining its ambassadors on their return voyage back to China. In one case, a merchant from Gujarat arrived at Kollam to make submissions to the Chinese embassies. All of these were presented to Kublai Khan's court as proof that distant polities acknowledged his supremacy, thus establishing him as a worthy successor to his grandfather Genghis Khan. Along with these courtly interactions, we also see a deepening of networks of merchants. Chinese traders also began to play a role in trade. They are mentioned travelling to India in large ships, even setting up a large pagoda in the Tamil port of Nagapattinam. The Yuan dynasty's encouragement of trade was so successful that they began to panic about the huge outflow of metallic currency which was being used to buy Indian luxuries like pearls and kingfisher feathers. Despite bans, trade and merchant movements continued to grow. By the time of the Ming dynasty in the 15th century, some Indian kingdoms were even hiring immigrant Chinese merchants to lead their embassies to China. Unlike the Yuan rulers who saw the Indian Ocean trade as a means to profit and prestige, the Ming Emperor Yongle was interested in establishing China as a civilizing power in the Indian Ocean, the culmination of diplomatic and commercial ties built up over centuries. The expeditions sent by his Admiral Chang He to southern India were a result of its emergence as an important trading partner in previous centuries. More in a future video. Strikingly, the Ming dynasty also interfered in the affairs of the Bengal Sultanate in the 15th century as we saw in this video. I know that sometimes pottery doesn't look as glamorous or interesting as a huge temple or poetry talking about a king killing bajillions of people, but just remember that the silent ceramics that survive from the Indian Ocean trade contain incredible stories of a time when South Asia held the upper hand over China in trade. A dynamic that made the fortunes of merchants and the careers of emperors. If you have questions or comments, we'd love to hear them. Follow us everywhere on social media. You can find me on Instagram at Anirbuddha and at Connected Histories and on Twitter at Akanaseti. We'll see you next week.